fun. Matthew 1, verse 21. Y'all gonna get y'all quiet tonight, ain't you? I can just tell y'all so quiet. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. When Joseph being raised from sleep, you remember this is when the angel came into Joseph's sleep. And I told you that the angels can invade your sleep. That's, that's just kind of a, a wild thing that subliminally, Jim, they can come right in there and start talking to us in our sleep. I, I woke up this morning, and uh, in my sleep was a pastor friend of mine who I've hunted with, rode horses with. And so as soon as I remembered, I, I texted him today. And, man, we had a good text back and forth. I didn't say I dreamed about you. That's kind of weird, you know, especially with a dude. But but it, but it was a good dream, and it was it was uh, uh, just just it was just it was a really a masculine opportunity for us to, to reconnect. And so I just said, so I believe the angels talk to us even in our sleep. When Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. You know, guys, over the last uh, month or so, our focus has been on uh, uh, the nativity story, Joseph the obedient supporter, Mary and Elizabeth, whom both needed miracles to conceive. Uh, midweek of last week, we dealt with the stable, the lowly place that the king of glory was born in order to relate with all the people and the wise men. And then, of course, Sunday, we dealt with uh, uh, the opportunity of the wise men coming and, and how they presented, how they had an entourage with them. They probably had a cavalry with them. It took a couple of years of traveling. But there's this perpetual thought that stands at the summit of the stable where Christ was born. It is the fascination of the soul that creates faith, the fulfilled prophecy that denotes God's ordained destiny and the promise of his presence that excites our spirit. It is the idea of God with us. Emmanuel, the correct rendering of the Hebrew title, would actually say with us is God. That with us, God is here. He's with us now. He's among us. So tonight I want to talk to you about God among us. As we move through it, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask, Lord, that the, it would jump off the pages, that revelation would catch us, that, Lord, there would be an excitement to go and tell the, uh, during this Christmas season about what Jesus means to us and how much you just being among us uh, has changed our lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Again, it's a direct quote. The angel went into the, the, uh, the brain of Joseph and quoted Scripture inside his head. You know, a lot of times we quote Scripture to ourselves. We, we remind ourselves, you know, greater is he that's in us, for God so loved the world. Things that we've learned. But what would happen if you didn't know those Scriptures and God just threw a Scripture in your brain and you woke up going, now, you ever did this? I wonder if that's in the Bible. You ever said that? I've heard people say, you know, the word, the Bible says that cleanliness is next to godliness. The Bible don't say that. Now, so maybe a, a funny dream you had did, but the Bible don't say that. And I meet people all the time that are trying to quote. They'll say stuff like this. I heard somebody say, well, everything happens for a reason. The Bible don't say that. It, if I want to give it to you, some things happen for a bad reason. They're not always good reasons. Come on, give me an amen. You're pondering right now. I can see it. I can see the little question marks over your head. But, but here the word came into, the, into his dream and here he quoted out of Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. No one, no one in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John ever called Jesus Emmanuel. His name was Emmanuel, but nobody ever said, hey, Emmanuel. They never used that word. As a matter of fact, this was his title. This was his description. This was his office. This was his position among us. It, people would never have to, you know, if you knew me and you said, hey, Jerry, that would be fine. I'd never have to hear the word pastor for me to know I'm a pastor. I'd just be pastor, and I'd just keep doing what I'm doing. I, I've been in jail, and I was pastoring in jail. No matter where I'm at, I'm still pastoring people. I still try to help people and encourage people and pull people in toward the gospel. So I don't always have to be called pastor to remind who I am. So if somebody says, Jerry, listen, guys, I a long time ago quit getting offended over somebody calling me Jerry. It doesn't bother. I had a man slide up next to me today at, 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 uh, at breakfast. I was eating with my son. He slid up next to me. I hadn't seen him in 15 years. He stood up next to me. As a matter of fact, he used to lead a men's meeting. He was head over the men in my former church, and he said, uh, he said, Pastor Jerry, I used to hate you. He said, no, I hated you. That's how he said it. I hated you. And I smiled at him, and I said, I know. 
because I knew I knew uh, the repercussions of my resignation and how it hurt people. When he said, I, I hated you. And I said, I know. And then I smiled at him and I said, but Robert, it would be a terrible thing for you to go to hell because of me, wouldn't it? And he went, yeah, you're right. Amen. You can't live life hating people. Can I get an amen? amen. And right at that moment, we re reconciled, and it, it was all good, and Judah was there, and he witnessed that. And, and I just kind of walked out there feeling free. It's not just your title, who you are, but that's what Emmanuel was. It was his title. And, and here's the question, guys, and you've got to answer this question. You've got to deal with it inside your spirit. It's the wrestling point of churches for over 2,000 years, and that is this. And I know these three words can cause division as soon as you say them. Is Jesus God? Some teach it that he's God's son only. Some teach that he was Mary's son. And first you go through Mary if you want to get good with the son and to the father. Some teach, you know, and, and I, so as I'm looking at scripture, I'm thinking, let me just try to prove this point to you. Because this is not a oneness teaching or a Trinitarian teaching, but it's a powerful thought. Is Jesus God? I'm going to answer it with one word. Yes. Yes, he's God. This question has caused such division in our churches. What is supposed to bring us together has served to separate us. Jesus Christ has been called God from the beginning of the New Testament. He claimed to be God. At the risk of his own life, he claimed to be God. In the book of John, chapter 10, verse 30, he said, I and my father are one. When the Jews took up stones again to stone him, we don't get as upset over this. We'll just leave one church and go to another. But, man, they, they wanted to kill him off. They picked up a stone. And Jesus answered, answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. You remember I told you everything Jesus both did and taught. He said, the good works I have showed you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, for what you said, because that you said, being a man, you made yourself God. It's a glorious mix-up. It really is. It's messed up when you read it. You can't wrap your brain around this. In the book of John, chapter 14, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Now, I don't know how was Jesus going to show him the Father. Was it going to be a hologram from heaven? I don't know what he wanted. But at that moment, when he said that, Jesus said to him, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, don't you know me? Don't you know who I am? Hadn't you figured this out yet? Anyone who has seen me has what? You've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Next slide. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Now, that's messed up. That's mixed up. That's glorious, actually, when you think about it. The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles himself. Now, hold on here just a second. He says here that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, and now the Scripture teaches us that Christ in us, the hope of glory. So if the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father and, the, and, and Christ is in you, guess who else is in you? Man, you're habitating a lot of glory. Can I get an amen? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of deity hanging out with you. You've got to start working this thing out in your head and realize that God is among us. He's hanging out with us. And if he is not, you should not worship him. Our songs should change. We should go to Father. We should go to God, Elohim, Jehovah. Uh, uh, but, but don't say Emmanuel. Don't say Jesus. Just leave those words out. Matthew 4.10, Jesus said unto him, Satan, he said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. If you remember, the question was, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. And Jesus said, you should worship the Lord your God, and only him should you worship. I'll go a little further. He receives worship as God. Matthew 2, 11, the wise men see the star in the east, and then what did they do? They came and worshiped the child. They worshiped him. They bowed down. They were overjoyed. Matthew 14, 22, the disciples worshiped him after he calmed the storm. That's a smart move. Amen. After the storms, you feel like you're fixing to die. They just begin to worship him. They begin to call him. Literally, he was God. In John 9, 38, a man born blind, after he is healed, worships him. We read that the lepers worship him. Uh, you don't worship anything that's not deity. You just don't do it. You, you, we don't, our, our, anything that you worship outside of Jesus is idolatry. I don't care if it's a vehicle, if it's a child, if it's a parent, if, it, if it's uh, something that you like doing, it's your hobby. Don't worship that stuff. Can I get an amen? Amen. He's called God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word say was 
was God. So the Word was God. This is, this is known as rhema. Logos is your written word. Rhema is the living word. So when Jesus walked among us and talked, he was spewing out the Word of God. He was. That's why when you, somebody once said, uh, read the red and pray for the power. That's what you need to do. Read the red. That's the Word of God. That's the words of Jesus. Stay on that. And by the way, I'll say this to those of you that may be just a, a new in this. Jesus did not write with a red ink pen. Amen. So I just want to throw that at you. John 1, 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It was made flesh. The word, the word was made flesh and the word was God. Now, am I convincing you? Am I helping you? Maybe you're not the crowd to convince. Maybe somebody out there is the ones I need to be convincing. But many times we divide over this thing and we, we mess up over it. I have no problem considering Jesus God. I have no problem knowing the Father's in heaven while Jesus is on earth. Why? Because I can't figure this stuff out. Why would uh, the blood would wash me away from my sins? How do I feel so peaceful and so joyful? And, um, my son said to me today, he said, Dad, every time I hear a Christmas song, I think of Aunt Sandy. That was my sister that died last year, 57. And I looked at him and I said, Judah, you are so right. Christmas music is Sandy. 50s music is Sandy. When I hear that music, I think of my sister. Amen. And I said, hey, and somehow I got to believe that I'm going to see her again, that this is not all there is, that we will see. And I said, it, it's a, it would be a cruel experiment for God to put us here, let us go through this life, and then die, and there not be something on the other side. It would be the, it would be the cruelest hoax in all of eternity. For, but I don't believe that. I believe that God has a place for those who have died and gone on, and one day we'll see them again. Amen. Jesus is God with us. Emmanuel is not God far away. Some believed in the, uh, when Jesus walked the earth that God was distant, that he, he got us started, and then he just let us go. I don't believe that. I believe that God has always been with us. He hears our cry. He's not distant and unconcerned. He is with us. From the beginning, he has been and desired to be among us. When man fell, when Adam fell in the garden, God never told Eve, God never told Eve, that I can remember in reading, uh, not to touch that tree. God told Adam, God told Adam, don't touch the tree. The reason Eve touched the tree is why? The man didn't teach the woman. I'm going to say something to our men in here. It's the men in this house that's got to learn to teach our wives and our children. That's the place that God put on us. In the beginning, God created man. He put him in the garden. There in the garden, he wanted him. Now, in the garden, what did he do? He gave him something. You ready for what he gave man? Watch this. It's, it's huge. Work. Work. He wanted men to work. I've said this for years, that you need a job before you get a woman. You need to have a job. You need to be working. Women, listen to me. They need to have a job before they come up and start, hey, hey. You need to make sure they got some money coming in. They, they can support you, look after you, and protect you because that's the place of the man. So in the, in the garden when Adam fell, when the sin took place and he partook of the peach, the apple, the banana, the, the mango, the pomegranate, whatever it was. I don't know what it was. Amen. Maybe that fruit doesn't even exist anymore. After that moment, Adam and Eve runs out of the garden. They feel shame. They feel uh, um, uh, they, feel, uh, they feel sin. They know something is wrong. And the scripture says, And when they heard the voice of the Lord God what, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid. I don't believe Adam had ever known fear until that moment. Because when sin came in the garden, fear came into the garden. Amen. And there's no longer faith. There's no longer sin. But he heard the voice of God, but he, he was afraid. He said, I was naked. I hid myself. I realized I was unclothed. Before then, you didn't even know that. You, you, you got along just fine. You were good. But now the shame had entered the garden. So when man fell, God was with us. He was and is omniscient. He's among us. Psalm 139. David said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the air uh, on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. This is a man that knew the power of the palace, the power of being in the in the in the cave, uh, uh, fighting. You know, can I just throw something at you just for fun here? Have you ever thought in Israel there were lions? Have you ever thought in Israel there were bears? 
No, we don't. No, I mean, we hunt. We do things. We know that you'd go to Africa for lions and things. But, but David's in Israel, and he kills a lion and a bear. I just want to throw that at you, that there was a time there was a lot more wild out there than there is right now. Amen. There was a lot more things to hunt. Can I get an amen? Amen. And, and, and David was a hunter. He was a man that had taken out a lion and a bear. But he said, no matter where I go, God is there. And that tells me there's nowhere you can go to get away from. He's omnipresent. Uh, he sojourned among us, Exodus 29. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that he's speaking to Moses now. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. I will dwell among them. But, you know, it was, God always wanted to come and hang out. He just, have you ever met somebody just want to hang out with you? They just think you're cool like that. They just want to hang out with you. That's God. He just wants to hang out with you. And there are certain people, I'll be honest with you, they don't think you're all that cool. And they really don't want to hang out with you that much. But God thinks you're cool. And he wants to hang out with you. He wants to be around you all the time. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to see your pleasures. He wants to, that, that, that is God for you. That's, that's our Father that wants to hang out. He wants to lodge. He wants to reside. Exodus 33, I didn't put this down, guys, but he, but he said, and he said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses actually said this, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going. In other words, I got to know your presence is here. When we worship Man, I got to feel his presence. When there are certain days I'm doing things, I just got to know that he's there with me. He, you know, with Joshua, he said, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. You're talking about a comfort for a successor. If you're going to succeed, somebody in the gospel, God be with me the way you were with them. Elisha was like, God, if you were with Elijah, be with me like you were with Elisha. And God gave him a double portion. He, you know, there's something about succession. A good succession always carries on that which the, that one which first started it did, with the preceder, whatever he did. They, they want to carry it on. But you can't carry on things without God. You say, well, I got the same last name. Doesn't mean nothing. You've got to have the presence of God. You've got to understand how powerful that is in your life. He leaves the same way. Jesus said, I am with you always, even until the end of the world, Matthew 28. And salvation is with us. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, why do we have to open the door? Somebody said that the Jewish doorknob was always on the inside. I don't know. But he says here that because then you got to, if you go out, you still got to figure out how to get back in. You don't want to lock yourself out. But when you read the scripture, it says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Well, why don't you just open the door, Lord? Well, maybe he's a gentleman. Maybe he just wants you to open the door. Maybe he wants to give you an opportunity to do something after all the stuff he's already done. So he says, open the door. I'll come in. I'll sup with you. I'll hang out with you. That's literally what it means. I want to eat with you. I want to fellowship with you. So we invite him in when we pray over our meals, we, when we give him thanks for things like that. This is keeping him there. In our trials, thank God he's with us. The scripture says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Hey, 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 Harvey. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, 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 you may not have felt it around here, but a lot of people in, the, in, in Houston and South Texas learned to pray real quick. Amen. They were getting hold of the Father because the waters were passing through. And when you pass through the waters, he said, I'll be with you. We're praying, God, be with us now. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, hello, California, when you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. That's him saying, I'll stay with you. Why? Because he was the fourth man in the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire. They looked down and said, one looks like the Son of God. Is he God? Absolutely. Can I get an amen? amen? In our work, and probably one of my happy things here, Mark 16, 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following them. 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, said Paul, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. There's the lion again there in the, the, uh, the a country of Israel out of the lion. So there was an understanding of that. But here's the thing I want you to see. The Lord working with them. The Lord stood with me. There are times you work and you get weary and you get tired and you got to remind yourself that I'm doing this as unto him and he's with me now. You got to keep working. If you grow weary in doing well, you won't reap what you've sown. I've heard a lot of people use the word lately, karma. Well, they got karma. Karma is just a, 
what is that? A, a, a gooberish word for reaping what you sow. That's all karma is. Amen. People use it. Uh, liberals use it. Others, hippies use it, things like that. But it's simply biblical that whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Amen. And if you don't grow weary in doing well, if you stay with it, that's, I always believe this about the church world. Man, we could use a couple of hundred more people in here on a Tuesday night, but you've got to stay with this. You got to keep hitting it. You got to keep believing. You got to believe God. You start bringing people in here. I know more people want to hear the gospel on a Tuesday night. So you just keep hitting and you keep hitting. And eventually, it, it's, it's a little sp uh, spring comes forth and people start talking. And then it opens up a little bit more, a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, the dam is loose and the place is packed. Yeah, I said all that. I am here silent amens to everyone. It's okay. I shot a bloodless pig the other day. It means I shot him and I couldn't find him, but I know I killed him. <laughs> amen. I got a silent amen. I have a bloodless pig either way. Joseph's got a bloodless pig too. You have a couple of them. Amen. In our sorrow, he's with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even through the valley. Even through the road. You know, in life, life is mainly made of valleys. It's not made of mountaintops. Mountaintops are tremendous experiences where you get to enjoy and breathe in, exhilarate. They're, they're wonderful. But the valley's where the real stuff takes place. You know, last year I took a ride on a motorcycle through uh, the mountains in, in uh, Colorado. And uh, in the valley it was 75, 80 degrees, and it was hot. And we got beat up by the rain. And, I mean, it was that. But when we hit the mountain peak, we went up through Monarch Pass, and it was snowing. You know, it's 80 degrees here, and it was snowing up there. You ain't got time to shift and put a jacket on. You got to get ready at the bottom. You can get ready for the top. But I'll tell you this. It was the most exhilarating ride of my life. I mean, you're running through the snow, and you're seeing that. Oh, I know it's a little dangerous, but, man, it's exhilarating. It's high top. It's exciting. The whole thing. I mean, I, could, I, I just wanted to run back up the mountain again and come back down. You know, it's just, it was just that kind of fun that you had. But, it, but you had to endure the valley first. You have to go through it. And he said, when you're going through the valley, I'm going to be with you through the valley. In our battles, he's with us. Zechariah 3, 17, the Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Qu to quiet with love is simply this. When a child is disturbed and crying and scared, and that mother comes in and begins to touch and run their finger through their hair and begin to talk to them and touch them gently and rub their cheek, there's that quietness because you know love's in the room. He said, I can quiet you in my I can remind you that I love you. Amen. Stay with it. And then I rejoice over you with singing. Again, I got to ask the question. I wonder what God sounds like to you. What is it? Does he sound like Taylor Swift? When God sings around me, it sounds like Toby Keith. Amen. It's getting a little bit more like a little Chris Stapleton in it. Or does God rap to you? You know, I don't know. What does he, what's he sound like to you? Maybe, huh? He sound like water to you? If that was at night in my dream, that would scare me. <laughs> okay, just saying. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. But, yeah, water. But what does he sound like? He sings over me. And, by the way, speaking of water, there's nothing like the sound of a huge waterfall. And nothing like, there's two things I really like looking into, large waterfalls and fires. There's just something about both of them. They're mesmerizing. They hold you. They get your attention. Amen. In our battles, he's with us. When we get there, he'll still be with us. And I'm going to start closing with a few words here. Revelation 21, 3. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. Are you catching this? Emmanuel, God with us. When we get to heaven, we're going to realize that all God really wanted, deity's dream was a family. He just wanted family. Uh, what do you want? Can I be honest? Most of you in your heart, you want family. When I ask a young lady, what do you want? Well, I want, I want a, a husband that really loves me, and I'd like to have a family someday. I just want a family. There's something about family. And even though they can be fractured and dysfunctional, hey, we've been that way since Adam and Eve. There's still something about family. In the church, the Scripture says that God sets the lonely in families. The church should be a family. This is what it should be like. So when I read this Scripture, now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away again. I, I don't know about you right now, and I'm not ready for all this yet, but I am looking for the day when the tears are wiped away, when there will be no more death. 
I'll meet people in heaven, and I'll know that they'll never die. We'll, we'll be alive eternally. That's it's hard to grasp, but we'll always be around. And, and there'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. And so then what does that do? That makes you press through in this life to keep moving on, to keep enduring, to say it's worth it, to stay. I, I'm going to stay the course. Because when this is over here, I mean, no, it's over. It's over. It's over. You don't get a say. Your mortality is so quick. Uh, I told someone the other day that this, this issue of mortality is, is, is stronger than you realize. When I was young, I had no thought of mortality. I was dangerous in a car. I was dangerous on a motorcycle. I was dangerous on a horse. I was dangerous with a gun. I mean, I lived life reckless. And as I got older, getting born again, understanding holy wild thinking the way I do, I still had a little bit of reckless abandonment to me. But the older I get, I realize that a lot of our real carefulness comes because we start sensing our mortality. And we realize, you know what, I'm not going to be here forever. i got to start being a little bit smarter. Amen. I got to start acting a little bit different. So the older I get, so I'm, I'm not, I'm, I think for some of you, you realize that pastor's starting to get a little revelation. Amen. Because we came to that knowledge a long time ago, but he's just now figuring this thing out. But the truth of the matter is, I realize that some people, that, that, that understanding mortality even puts a little fear in your life. And that's what I got to keep battling because I don't want to live in fear. Fear has paralysis. I don't want to be paralyzed. I want to keep enjoying life. I want to keep pressing through it. But I also have got to realize that, that I, I want to be here for the grandkids and whatever God has and whatever's coming on. And then when this life is over, it's over. It's done with. Amen. And then we can go on. For those with whom he is not with. You know, this comes to the sad part of this message. For those that he's not with, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Do you want to know what hell is? Hell is a life of eternity without the presence of God. That's hell. Forget the fire. Forget the worms. Forget the separation from those that you loved here. Forget being able to communicate or talk or be able to send word back to the other side. Forget all of that. That's hell enough. But add to it this thought that you'll be shut out from his presence. When I call on God, I feel like he hears me. When I pray to God, I feel like he hears me. I prayed for a young lady today whose body is all busted up. I prayed that, that God would start mending her and putting her back together and get her mind right, amen, through all the things she's gone through. He, here's the thing with all of this to me is that I, I can call on God now and I believe that, but my prayers will go unanswered in hell. I believe there will probably be more people praying in hell than they are praying on earth because we forget about it here. But in hell, they got to be talking. they got to be saying, I wish I'd have done right. They shut out from the presence of God. I don't want to live that way. The rest of the verse says, On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you, our preaching to you. You heard the word of God being preached, and you believed that Jesus saved, and you accepted him as your Savior. And because you believed, we good. Everybody say, we good. Amen. Amen. Stand with me. Such a familiar scripture out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Here's a little homework for you. If you haven't read your Bible a few chapters late, lately, read chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, and come on into chapter 13. When you read 11, you're going to hear about faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Then it's going to walk through there and tell you by faith Abraham, soldier to a place, was looking for a, a builder and an architect. He's looking for God. You're going to read about Moses, who for the joy set before him endured the shame. Uh, I'm sorry, that's what Jesus did. Moses, the Bible says to him, that he, he dealt with, the, uh, he, he, he refused to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And he hung out with people who were enduring affliction. Now, I said that wrong, but that's pretty much what Moses did. That's when I understood that sin was a season. It's a seasonal long thing in people's lives. Sometimes just don't give up on people. Just pray their season ends quick. Amen. Uh, you know, and you walk through it, and you read about Samson. Some people say, well, Samson didn't make heaven. You know what happened to Samson? He went through a, a blinding in his eyes. He went through a grinding in a pit. But he also went through a finding. The Scripture says his hair began to grow again. And through that, he got up into the pillars, and he pushed over the pillars, and the Philistines were killed. Killed more in his death than he did in his life, and that was his mission in life, 
was to be the ruler and to take out the evil of the day. He just kept getting called up. He was a he-man with a she-problem. Can I get an amen? Okay, all the men said amen. All the women said, Ooh, okay. But, but you, you walk through that and you understand that and you pick up. But then we get to Hebrews and you realize this man made it to heaven because he made Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of faith. It's the hall of faith. You know, many of us have deer heads on our walls and things like that. What I'm going to tell you, there's, there's a hall somewhere with posters on it. And it's got David on it. And it's got Barak on it. And it's got Ruth on it. And it's got David on it. And it's got Samson on it. It's got Moses on it and Abraham on it. They're all on that wall because they're all in Hebrews chapter 11. Then you hit chapter 12 and you hear about the king who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And you walk through this thing and you realize how much God is with us in Hebrews 12. Then when you hit chapter 13, these verses are what sticks out. Keep your lives free from the love of money. You're okay to have money. Just don't let money have you. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, I never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He's Emmanuel, God among us. God with us. With us is God. He never left us. Father, I thank you for your presence in this house. I thank you for your word. My heart hears your voice. I do hear you as a as a country singer sometime, Lord. Sometimes you sound, like Jennifer said, like water. Lord, but I do know your presence. I know it when I sense it. My prayer is, God, that all of us will be invaded, perhaps by an angel in our sleep. The word of God will come forth in our lives. That you'll speak through us somehow, some way. And this year, Lord, as we begin to prepare for 2018, we'll start with a whole new oomph, a whole new gathering, a whole new desire. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Go get your kids. Believe me, David just got started with his sermon.